Hi, Andrea. Thank you so much for joining us today on Policy Chats. It's so great to have an alum on the podcast. Just to get things started, I was wondering if you could describe what your work entails. Hi, Dinara. No, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Um, well, I work in a nonprofit public um, health organization. So we specialize in implementing upstream population level prevention programs with the end goal of reducing health disparities and advanced um, equity. Uh, so I do my work according to our mission, which means I work alongside communities to build power, empower their voices, um, work towards challenging the systems in place. Uh, we also protect health and improve overall quality of life by doing this. Um, but to be more specific, my work entails um, a secondhand smoke multi-unit housing initiative in LA City. So it's an LA City-wide initiative that I've been working on for over a year and a half, a little over a year and a half now. Yeah, that um, you had mentioned some of the long-term goals. Those are extremely important and very uh, Im imminent in this specific area. Um, I know you had kind of touched on this, but um, a little more specifically, could you describe some of the short-term and long-term effects of community work that you've seen? Yeah, so I'll go over, uh, I guess it's three goals. So it's short-term, um, intermediate, and then long-term goal. Um, our short-term goal is to work alongside our, our coalition group, also with uh, local nonprofits, um, and even local government, it names to just spread education, uh, garner support, and you know, throughout all, all of LA City. So that's our short-term goal, to build those relationships. Um, our intermediate goal would be to adopt a compre comprehensive smoke-free multi-unit housing ordinance that will hopefully create a system change and have a policy in place, which would be a step toward sustainability um, in LA City. And so sustainability will then go into our long-term goal, which would be to protect all of LA City residents um, who are living in multi-unit housing. So this means um, tenants who, who are renting in multi-unit housing, meaning apartments, condominiums, duplexes, anything where they're sharing a wall with a neighbor. Um, so that is our long-term goal is to just protect them and help them um, from secondhand smoke exposure. Andrea, I think the topic of secondhand smoke is very captivating because I, for one, didn't really know much about the topic of secondhand smoke until pretty much now. Would you be willing on expanding on what you mean by that a little bit, please? So secondhand smoke is um, when someone is, you're not the smoker, right? But someone is smoking um, and you're inhaling that um, smoke that's being emitted by that by the person who smokes um and of secondhand smoke even though you're not smoking can have effects and will have effects it it depends if, if you're an adult or a child it does differentiate symptoms can be from mild to severe mild being like ear infections uh, maybe like sinus and you know, sinus infections but then also severe being asthma attacks um developing asthma and then also um, respiratory diseases. And for adults, more severe ones are maybe even, and doesn't always have to be lung cancer, but it can be cancer, uh, even uh, heart disease, such as diabetes, cholesterol, just worsening those conditions for adults. Yeah, um, it's really interesting, the serious effects that can come from um, secondhand smoking. I know currently there, as demographic wise, there are, are much fewer smokers in say the like 18 to 24 year old range in comparison to how it was 30, 40 years ago. How does that play a role in the work you do, this change in demographic with smoking? So now what that's being seen is the, old, the older generation who, who was smoking, you know, research said, and I'm pretty sure that it's even, we're seeing it caused cancer then. So they realize, okay, there's something we need to leave. It's, we need to quit. But I'm sure many of you are also familiar with vapes. Um, so that's what the new trend is. Kind of, it's unfortunate, but it is a new trend amongst younger generations. Um, 
as early as middle school is what is being seen now. Um, and so, as I mentioned previously, uh, we're aiming for a comprehensive um, ordinance and policy to go in place. So this comprehensive ordinance we're hoping will, you know, also include vapes. Um, just because again, there's that many, they're, they're not harmful, but studies have shown that they also, um, it's an aerosol at the end of the day, and it does contain high levels of nicotine. Higher than, sometimes higher than traditional cigarettes or cigars and, you know, so it, at the end of the day, it we we want that to be included um, because again, also we're hoping if included, it, it will be, um, it will influence new generations to not uh, vape. Uh, for example, there's the Berkeley model, which we which was an ordinance placed in the city of Berkeley, um, and there's smoke-free multi-unit housing ordinance, say encom encompassing vapes, cigars, cigarettes, cannabis. So that's something that's our end goal. Hopefully, uh, including vapes for and to you know uh, it would affect that younger generation. That's a very interesting answer, Andrea. And on the topic of demographics, I'm interested if from your work, you've seen health discrepancies, especially with smoking in certain communities as it pertains to gender, ethnicity, or even race. Thank you, Andrew. So yes, um, research, research has shown that usually in black and brown communities, so African-American or Latinos or Latinx, are most affected by it, um, especially children. They've seen that African American and Latino children have um, are most likely to develop uh, asthma as effect of as you know as a consequence of living in multi unit housing. So apartments is typically where they live, and usually the the areas they live in are underfunded. Um, you know they they lack the policy to protect them. And so since they are most likely living in multi-unit housing, they're most likely exposed. That's just a statistic. If you're sharing a wall with someone, you're most likely going to be exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, and consequently, they can't be moving. It's, you know, it's also a, a, a because of means, you know, they don't have the financial means. They can't move. For example, in my work, I've spoken, I've been exposed to, to different um, demographics and also, um, where they come, like economically, financial background. I, I've spoke with people who live in very wealthy areas, so it's like high top condos, who are exposed to secondhand smoke and also have a secondhand or no smoking policy in their lease or even in, you no, know, it's a no smoking property. Um, at the end of the day, they're still being exposed. So they're like, they, they get tired of it and they move, but you know, they have the means to move. Um, unfortunately, I've also spoken to individuals who are just living day by day, making it day by day, check by check. Uh, and they say, well, I can't move. There's no way I can move. Um, and sometimes they've been living there for years. So, you know, if they move elsewhere, you're in LA city, it's going to be super expensive. So it, it's unfortunate, but I, I we do see that um, disparity in uh, racial demographics, but also financial terms. Andre, I think that was a very captivating answer. And I was wondering if based on this data set that you've collected in the research that you've seen, if you and your work target these specific communities and have different um, ways of, you know, of, of stopping the smoking and getting people into better housing. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Actually, thankfully we, the data that we work off has already been collected. Our data has been collected by UCLA. Um, so the data portion has been collected. Now it's us trying to, you know, incorporate a passive policy. Um, so it, it is different and varies from community to community. And as I like to say best, community members know best for their community. Um, I go in, I, I do my work. But at the end of the day, it's it's them who choose what they want to see in their community. It's them who choose what policy they want to see in place. Um, because I'm going in as you know, uh, 
going into their community. They're the ones who live there and immer are immersed in the community, so they know best. Um, I can I hear their stories, but at the end of the day, they we try to empower them to voice their to to voice their concerns. You know, so um, it it is different because what works for some communities might not work for others. Each community is unique to their own. So yes, I do think um, each community has a different. Um, policy that needs to also be put in place. I mean, this is an LA citywide initiative. So it, it's huge. It, it's going to be big, but it, we want to encompass all of LA City. But when it comes to other cities or the states, uh, other counties, it might look different from LA City. A lot different, actually. <laughs> LA City is unique, I think. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that each community is unique. There's so many different aspects that play into what the community could want for their future goals, how they view other communities and how they're approaching um, similar issues, especially with the multi-unit, um, multi-family housing um, and the smoking initiative. Um, as you mentioned, you go in and you're trying to spread this message. Um, being involved in the conversation is a, a crucial part of community work. What challenges would you face in regarding getting the word out and does social media play a role? Yeah, so um, one of the biggest challenges since you mentioned social media has been sometimes even retainment of, of members who, who join us because uh, as I previously mentioned, a lot of those members we work with, you know, community, re community residents are uh, working class so they are working constantly it's you know they don't just have their nine to five where they get to go home at the evening and and join meetings or you know join the city council meeting get involved um, unfortunately sometimes they're they work from early hours to late hours or graveyard shifts so then it's it's hard um to have a scheduled meeting and just having them um stay another uh conflict that comes with that is language um, sometimes there is that language barrier or even um, technology can be a barrier uh, a lot of the communities we work with or residents are uh, as i mentioned previously latinx and they're um, like first generation here the they're immigrants and sometimes technology is new to them so helping them navigate that can be difficult um, as well and especially now you know, after COVID, everyone meets through Zoom. So it, it can be difficult. We try to meet their needs and try to be there in person, right? But with with all these um, uh, or, or even uh, precautions in place, you know, we still need to keep in mind about COVID. Uh, we can't meet as often in person. Uh, another thing is we, we do a social media outreach. But again, that goes into technology where, where they have difficulty with technology. Of course, not all, but there is that portion or, or um, audience who, who finds it difficult. So it's usually um, a Spanish speaking audience or even um, even people who, who are immigrants or elderly, because when it comes to technology, some of uh, those who are elders uh, find it difficult, especially to join a meeting via Zoom Sometimes we have to call them and, and you know direct them where to push the buttons. And it's small things like that that really do go a long way. Uh, but when it comes to social media, we do have a social media page. We try to be as active. We translate our materials into Spanish, Spanish so we do provide both English and Spanish. Um, again, just try to, to compensate everyone and you know try to help everyone and make it as easy as possible and as accessible as possible for them to be engaged. And oh wait, I, I did also want to add um, another challenge we have faced uh, other than um, retainment or sometimes um, engagement has been uh, collaborating with other organizations. Since we are focused in secondhand smoke and multi unit homes, um, unfortunately some it's new to some people. Some people assume that multi-unit homes are just smoke free, especially if you live in a single unit home. You, I think it's something that never crosses your mind. 
for example, it never crossed my mind. It, it, this was new work to me because I had never thought, oh, wow, you know, um, individuals who live in multi unit homes are, are facing health disparities because, you know, just because they live in a, an apartment. Uh, so sometimes we have tried to reach out to um, other organizations. For example, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, we've reached out to renters' rights organizations or tenants rights organizations where in my head, I'm, you know, I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity because we've spoken with several tenants who who, who want a smoke-free um, environment, who want to breathe free from smoke. And when, when we approach these organizations, unfortunately, sometimes they assume our, organ, our goal is eviction, which is far from what we want to do. We, we live in LA city, so we are, are aware and we acknowledge that we have a homelessness crisis. So that's the last thing we need. Uh, and we do try to explain, you know what, this is, we're, we are trying at the end, we're transparent. We want, we want to enhance the quality of life of those living in apartments or condominiums or townhomes. Uh, but again, that, that message can get mixed. And at the end of the day, each sometimes organizations have their own end goal where they miss opportunity to collaborate. Um, uh, and we try to be a tra as transparent, bring in speakers, other experts, for example, lawyers, um, respiratory um, doctors. So we do try to, or even other tenants, we try to bring to, to explain to them our work, you know, sometimes that's when they're more open. And then sometimes they have been more open when we bring other tenants bringing up this concern. Uh, and that's another conflict we've seen, but overall, I, I think, just continuing education and continuing trying to reach out and and seeing that we're involved will help them um, kind of be more welcoming to us. Andrea, that was a great answer, and it actually it actually pretty much humbled me because I think too many times, especially me, I kind of just throw social media as the fixer for everything, you know. But as you mentioned, the differences in the technological advancement and even language barriers can inhibit and the effectiveness of social media. So given all these variances in social economic status and race, what challenges does policymaking um, do, you, do you face and what kind of obstacles do you have to overcome in that regard? Well, we, I think another one is we work with a community who I guess, uh, again, going back, who are constantly working, who are not sometimes politically involved at all. They they don't even know how to go about going to a, a council, a city council meeting or, or providing public comment. And that's when we think it's essential to have, you know, to to have a policy or a motion at least started in LA City. Um, so when we have spoken with community, we think it's important to also provide trainings or capacity building um, for them, you know, encouraging them to provide public, public comment despite what language they, they speak, because LA City, fortunate, they fortunately have um, translations, but empowering them to, to attend those meetings, how to navigate the system, providing them that, those steps, as well as having them meet um, in their, their council district um, staff. So LA City, for those who don't know, um, is is I'm gonna start over. So for those who don't know, LA City has 15 districts. Um, so, and those 15 districts are broken down into uh, smaller neighborhood councils. So we encourage them at least to start off with their neighborhood councils wherever they live. So, imagine they live in Panorama City, they live in Studio City, Van Nuys. Smart with those. Start with those smaller cities. You know your your small neighborhood council and, and try to bring it to them. You know address this issue and then maybe scale up to LA City. It might be intimidating to go to an LA City council meeting. But you have like you have five, 15 council or not uh, fifteen? Excuse me. Oh yes, you do have fifteen council members um, there. So that is difficult. Um, and speaking about council members, another thing that comes to mind. LA City just had re-elections. So when you're speaking about creating policy uh, in LA City, it's 
can be it can be difficult or it's actually can be beneficial to to you right now because a lot of these new council members are new um and if we're bringing policy to them we're, we're introducing introducing uh issues to them either one my you know they, they want to be champions for for that motion or that policy they will take it you know their 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 office will take it or two they might not know yet and might not want to contribute or they're still busy um hiring staff so that has been a, a, an issue right now it's just kind of transitioning after from the new elections that la city just had so those are sometimes things that can affect policy not going to lie it's it's unfortunate but it can affect it and sometimes even scandals in la city can't can affect it like within council members can also have we've seen at least personally that has affected our our work yeah it is um good to suggest the first step to getting involved is really understanding where the policy is coming from and really approaching um, the council members, even if that isn't something they've done before. It is a good first step. Um, going back to a point you had made earlier about vapes and smoking from a young age, um, what kind of challenges exist when addressing the issue compared to traditional forms of smoking in older generations? I know you mentioned, um, of course, going to the um, using social media and going to the communities. Will any of this adjust or change um, as the demographic changes in the future? Well, there's also, I also want to highlight that LA City recently, not LA City, it was California, recently passed a uh, flavors um, vaping ban. Like they had a, a, no, like you can't have, you can't buy any flavored um, vapes. And I think that was the biggest concern parents had um, because a lot of the children are attracted to the vapes because of the flavors they have. Strawberry, grape, cotton candy, you name it, they have it all. So um, other than going to community and social media, we do try to attend PTA meetings. That's, that's also part of the community. Um, but also sometimes providing parents with education of what vapes look like. Uh, they're so discreet nowadays. It, it's hard to identify. It can look like a USB. It can look like a pen. It, you you really don't know. And parents sometimes aren't aware of these things. Um, so we do try to keep them aware. Sometimes speaking, just giving children hard facts um, might help them realize, but also not just giving them hard facts. Sometimes that doesn't work, but it's also providing those resources. That's, I think, it, it's kind of providing those cessation resources to help them quit. Uh, again, that's if they want to. We, we're just here as to provide the resource and that service. But at the end of the day, it's up to the individual. When they are ready, we, we let them know we are here to provide you those cessation resources. Um, and that's how we try to go about it for that younger generation. I know California tried to go about it by, you know, banning flavored um, tobacco. So that's a approach they're taking, and we still have yet to see how that will go about because it just recently, um, I think it recently got enforced in, it must have been December 26 or 22 of uh, last year of 2022. So it, it recently went into play, so that's yet to see how, you know, if it will work or not. Um, I, I believe those are the only things right now being in place to help that younger generation, other than education, policies in place, educating parents. Um, it's it's the newer policy that's in place right now. Andre, it's really shocking to hear how deep of an extent the challenges that you actually face are. Now, I'm just wondering if the community or even college students can even do anything to help this effort. You know what, I, I think it's great that you asked that because uh, a lot of college campuses have also pushed for smoke-free spaces and a lot of college campuses are. So I think that's a start first to have a smoke-free um, space in college just because you know what, it's a learning environment. Um, there's a lot of youth there too um, who can support. 
For example, a lot of students do live off campus, so they might still be exposed in the apartments they live, especially if it's not um, part of uh, college housing. So there's still sometimes apartments who are part of the college and owned you know, by the college. So they still have that smoke-free space in those apartments, but those who live that are completely off campus, not, you know? So I, I think it's important for those students who can help um, this initiative. They can voice their concerns to property owners, property management, uh, because at the end of the day, they, they will be affected by it too, as well. Um, and if, if they're living in a property that is not, you know, owned by school, so then they're not being protected the same way if it's just uh, by a single property owner or a property management team. And the way they can get involved is by addressing it to their other peers or uh, other neighbors, addressing it to their landlords or property management. Uh, and, you know, just attending also their local government meetings. Again, that's something, you know, saying I go to this X and Y school, I, I, you know, I'm living in this city and this is what's bothering me. I, I think that's an important way they, they can get involved as well. Thank you so much for the insight. And unfortunately, we are starting to run out of time. So I'm going to be asking our final question, which is what part of your job has been the most rewarding to you? So the most rewarding thing about my job has been capacity building within communities. Um, for example, some communities who I've worked with don't feel as empowered to voice their concerns. However, after capacity training of, of how to address um, issues within your local city government, um, now they feel empowered. If they have any other issue, aside from the smoke they're being exposed to, they feel um, comfortable going to a city council meeting or neighborhood council meeting and speaking out um, versus before this, the capacity building training started, they were very timid or shy to, to voice their concerns. They believed that their concern didn't matter um, or they also felt defeated that nothing can be done about it. They kind of just accepted it um, versus now where, where they're like, you know what, I do have a right. Even if I might be just a, a Spanish speaker or even if I'm an immigrant, even if I'm from working class, my rights matter, you know? So so I think seeing that transformation throughout this year and a half or over a year and a half of be working with them, it's it's been wonderful because I know they'll take that with them anywhere they go, you know? So, so that's something that's rewarding to me. That's great to hear. Too often, you know, I'm sitting in class and we're getting lectured on the big social economic gap that exists in our society, in our society, and that really is um, sorrowful because you know we, we no one wants to see inequity within our society, and it's because of people like you that really our societies are becoming more equal. People are becoming um, greater economically speaking, socially speaking, and even and even health wise, and it's it's the work that you do that really embolden and make these communities flourish. So we thank you so much. And again, thank you for your time. And we really hope to be working with you in the future again. Thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you, Dinara. I, I really appreciate you um, having me here. And it was a great time speaking with you. Thank you so much.